We're going to talk at the end about whether or not microservices are right for you. But it's very important to understand what benefits microservices bring. If you don't need these benefits, maybe you don't need microservices. Why is it that people are really interested in this stuff? What are the advantages that this sort of architecture gives us? These small, independent, autonomous components, are they going to make my business more successful? They can make my developers happier? Let's dive a little bit into the advantages of microservices, what they bring, and see whether or not that's the sort of thing that might be right for you. Firstly, microservices allow you to align your organization to your architecture. What I mean by this is that with a large code base, if you have, you've got, say, two or three or four teams, you're all sort of fighting over that code base. Who gets to check in now? Who's in charge of this part of the code? It can be often quite difficult to know, to have autonomy in making your changes because all too often you're stepping on each other's toes. This can be exacerbated, for example, if those teams are in different geographical locations. With a microservice architecture, you can align ownership of the different assets, or ownership of the services, to independent teams. That makes it much easier to, for example, let the team in Portland own these three services and the team in California own these five services and have them sort of much more autonomous in how they change and how they evolve independently from each other. The coarse grain communication possible at an organizational level between teams matches the coarse grain communication between the APIs of the components. This can be especially useful for organizations that are changing, that are expanding rapidly. Rather than throwing more bodies into, a set, into the same code base and having the associated challenges of large teams, instead you could actually look to break up architectures to allow you to scale more, to maybe add more people, to hit a delivery date, or to bring in different people, different partners perhaps, or deal with teams in remote locations. In many ways, this is just an architectural style which takes advantage of a thing called Conway's Law, this idea that architectures, that systems, end up looking like the results of the communication structures of the organizations that create them. Eric Raymond said that you have seven people, you end up with a seven-pass compiler, and it's sort of that idea. Often when you see organizational structures that don't match the architecture, you get a lot of tension. With microservices, you get a high degree of flexibility about who owns what, which can allow these two things to be in sync. Those organizations that do microservices well, all too often they are aligning themselves. They are evolving the architecture and organizational structure at the same time to get the most benefits. Let's think about a monolithic application. I want to make a one-line change. I make that change, I check it in. But I probably have to run the tests for the whole monolith because it's not always clear to me what tests should and shouldn't be run for a given change. So I have to run all the tests. And it's one big deployment. So now I've got to deploy everything. Now deploying everything is a fairly sizable piece of work. It could be a high degree of risk. And yet it may only be a one-line change. That higher degree of risk, the fact that it's the whole thing that changes, can often result in us wanting to make those changes less frequently as a result. And as we all know, the less frequently you make changes, the bigger the batch size, the bigger the risk. And everybody wants to ship software faster. If we get our microservices right, however, we can make a change to one service, redeploy it independently of the rest, allowing us to make changes much more seamlessly. That's one of the goals. To do that, we're going to have to get a few things right. And that's really what the principles are going to be about that we're going to come on to shortly. There's a great book called The Art of Scalability that talks really about how you scale applications. There's a mental model they introduced that I really like called the scaling cube. The scaling cube talks about three different axes of scaling. We've got horizontal duplication, which is having lots of the same thing, so maybe load balancing a service. We have data partitioning, for example, where I might direct users A to M to one cluster of machines and users N to Z to a different cluster of machines. And the last one they talk about is functional decomposition. The idea that by breaking apart functions that you can scale components independently of each other to allow you to have improved resilience or improved throughput. Functional decomposition is what microservices are. Many organizations look to break systems apart to allow them to scale components independently and often more cost effectively. You may appreciate that the bigger the machine you get, 
the more it costs you to get, say, an additional set of resources. It can often be much more cost effective to have a large number of smaller machines and a small number of large machines. If you can break your services up, if you can perform some functional decomposition into microservices, you can often more cost effectively scale out your application. With a monolithic application, when it comes to security, we often have to put all of our eggs in one basket. And then we have like one big wall around the outside. We get to have one perimeter. We hope no one gets in to affect our application. But with microservices, we have lots of small independent components. That means that we can, say, look at the one service that has the most sensitive data, that has the uh, most, you know, where maybe we're dealing with payment details, customer records, and we can focus our protections on that one place. Maybe it's on, you know, sort of a hardened operating system. We can look closely at how data is set in transit to and from this service. We can focus our attentions on protecting data at rest. But for those services which are less sensitive, we can provide maybe less oversight. Whereas often with a monolithic system, we don't get to make those choices. Often we have to treat everything in the same way. The fact that we have these separate services then allows us to look at different segregation models, allowing us to, for example, have more than one perimeter. Again, collections of services that we worry about the most could be inside separate network segments with additional protections at multiple levels. Things that you just can't do easily if you have a more monolithic system. And so microservices may give us some abilities to handle security in a much more elegant and sophisticated way, giving our services and our customers more protections as a result. One of the things I see quite often when talking to organizations and working with organizations that have microservices is that they tend to have a variety of different technologies in play. This is in part because they have multiple separate deployable units that allows them to look at different technology choices, different deployment platforms, different languages, database choices. Whereas with a monolithic system within a single code base, we're often looking for consistency. That will drive us towards, say, a single programming idiom, maybe a single type of data store. With microservices, we can vary those choices a bit more. Because ultimately, as long as the API still work, we don't really care what happens inside the service too much. Whether or not you decide to use multiple technologies in your microservice system, you've got the option to. Maybe you want to find out whether or not Clojure is the next best thing, and I happen to think it is. But then you could take the service that's maybe involves the, the least risky code. It's one of a small administration interface, a reporting dashboard. It's not something that if it fails, it's necessarily going to cause a huge outage or anything. And maybe you target that one component and say, let's try using Clojure here. And if that works, you can learn from that. This allows you to have a sort of a more balanced portfolio of risk around technology. We may not know what the next big thing coming along is, but we do know that we need to be better at embracing new technologies to find that competitive advantage. And microservices may be one way of helping you achieve that in a safer manner. I'm sure many of you have at least one phone. If you think about the number of mobile devices that are out there right now, it's, it's pretty surprising. When mobile first came along, we started approaching how we deliver our services to it in a fairly simplistic manner. Many of us had websites. So we had a stack around delivering that website to our customer. And then someone came along and said, I need it on my mobile device. And you know what we did? We sort of hacked it in the side. Maybe we had some sort of layer in the middle. We might even have reached out to a third party that creates the mobile version of our website. And that's how we approach things. And we started thinking about dual channel, desktop web, and mobile. But the world isn't that straightforward anymore. We don't just have mobile, a single mobile device, and a desktop web. The world is much more nuanced than that. It's not just the large variety of different mobile devices, as we can see here, that we might have to target. And which one of these is really mobile? Do I want to deliver the web desktop web experience to some of these devices? Do I need to be more nuanced in what I deliver? But we're even delivering our services over things like wearables. The ways in which our customers interact with our services is changing. It's becoming much more multifaceted. 
The idea, therefore, that I can have a, a sort of a big monolithic stack and sort of wedge things into the side to deliver a good quality service doesn't make sense anymore. I like to think of user interfaces as ways in which we sort of combine the capabilities in different ways for different devices. The same customer is going to interact with my service in one way with a mobile device, a mobile phone, a different way with a tablet, a different way with a wearable. And so being able to recombine those capabilities for those different user interfaces is key, especially when the pace of change in this space is so much faster. With microservices, we break apart these monolithic seams and present lots of finer grain seams. We present those capabilities in different ways so that when that new device comes along, it's going to be easier for you to reach out to the things you need, combine them in the right way, and present them back to your users. Just to summarize, microservices allow us to align the architecture to the organization and the organization to the architecture. They allow us to release functionality faster as we can make changes to individual components and release them into production by themselves. They allow for independent scaling. We can take one component and scale it up or down as needed without having to scale the whole system. They make it easier to focus on security and implementing security where it's really needed. They allow us to adopt technology faster, potentially experimenting with new things that might help us you know, be more effective, more efficient. It can often lead to happier developers as well. And finally, they allow us to embrace the uncertainty in a digital age. We may not know what type of interface or wearable device is coming around the corner, but with finer grained APIs that the microservices present us, we've got a lot more opportunity to adapt.